Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 394th episode, we're back temporarily from our family leave. Yes, we have the baby now. We do. (laughs) And we still managed to see Jurassic World Dominion as promised. Yes. And we also had a chance to watch Prehistoric Planet, which was really great. So we're going to talk about that, too. That's not something we were expecting at the beginning of the year when we were planning out what we were doing this year. But we're going to talk about all of that and sort of compare some of the dinosaurs which were shown in both and also talk a lot about Jurassic World because there's a lot to talk about. And we have a dinosaur of the day, Morose, and a fun fact. But of course, as always, before we get into all of that, we want to thank some of our patrons, especially now with our family growing and You know, we got to buy a lot of baby stuff and everything. (laughs) We really appreciate everybody's support. So we have four new patrons to thank this week. And they are Robert, Adam, George, and T-Bear. Thank you all so much for joining us. And I know there are more people who have joined since our last episode, but we're a little bit behind on shout outs. I'm sorry, but I promise we'll get to yours as soon as we're back from leave if we haven't already. And then rounding out our shout outs, we also have Trev, JC, Anne, Elias, Luke, and Ben. Yes, thank you so much, everyone. And like Garrett mentioned, with our growing family, uh, you know, some of your support is going directly to Dino Onesies for the baby. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't know where you were going with that. That they are. We have a pretty good selection of dinosaur stuff already. And that means a lot of the stuff is blue because, of course, dinosaur clothes are always assumed to be boy clothes. Well, blue is a great color, but we have found a handful of onesies that were meant for girls. I don't know why at newborn age it's divided into (laughs) boys and girls. Why can't everyone like dinosaurs? But anyway. (laughs) Yeah, it's weird. But somebody did find us one that I think has dinosaurs and unicorns and maybe rainbows on it, which is <laughs> appreciated. So anyway, so without further ado, let's get into all about Jurassic World Dominion and a little bit about Prehistoric Planet. But first, I want to talk more about Jurassic World Dominion generally. Well, we'll be focusing on the dinosaurs from both, I should clarify. Well, yeah, but I, I want to talk a little bit about the movie generally because sure. you kind of have to. And a huge spoiler alert because the whole episode is basically spoilers. So if you haven't seen Jurassic World Dominion yet, you should skip this episode until you watch the movie. You could maybe listen to it if you haven't watched Prehistoric Planet yet because that show is a lot less spoilerable since it's sort of a documentary style show. Mm. It's not like you're going to wonder what's going to happen at the end because... They only show a dinosaur for like five minutes and they're on to the next one. So, Well, I was always wondering what dinosaur comes next. Yeah. And there are points where you're like, what is this dinosaur going to do? Because they they do some interesting stuff. But yeah. So if you haven't seen these things, maybe skip this episode for now and come back once you've watched the movie. So starting with Jurassic World Dominion, because that's newer and originally what we were only planning on talking about for this episode, (laughs) I really enjoyed the beginning of Dominion. Just like with Fallen Kingdom, it featured more fun scenes with dinosaurs and interesting environments than Mm -hmm. the later part of the movie. Yeah, you had the news clips. There were a couple of short scenes where you see some dinosaurs interacting with people, and it's like, how do these people problem solve? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So again, it started with the Mosasaur, and this time it was taking down a crab boat. Oh yeah, not a dinosaur, but still. Yeah, true. Good good clarification. <laughs> but a lot of times they start with Mosasaur. I think they did maybe in all three of them. They definitely in did the in Fallen two. Kingdom, yeah. And I found, I thought that scene was excellent as always. The Mosasaur is obviously way too big compared to the boat as it always is. They scaled it way up to make it bigger and badder and everything. But, you know, it's Jurassic World or Jurassic Park, so you can always explain it with, well, they did the genetic modifications and now it's bigger than it should be, which is perfectly appropriate, I think, for a monster movie and makes it more fun to watch. So I'm cool with that. I also liked the other little clips they showed, like they had a little girl getting chased by compies. Mm -hmm. So it looked like in her yard or something. There was a clip we had seen of a stegosaurus walking across a mountain road and a car swerving off a cliff to avoid it. And I didn't notice the first time that I saw that clip because we saw that one before. I can't remember if it was at the end of Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom or maybe it was just in some sort of trailer release over the last couple of years. But 
they did a really good job of making it look like one of those videos somebody shoots with a GoPro yeah. like on their dash because you could actually see a little hood scoop on the car like it was somebody like really winding through the mountain roads like having a good time driving mm -hmm. and they're like oh no <laughs> there's a dinosaur swerve so it was like very well done I think that brief little clip. They also showed some doves getting eaten by pterosaurs oh, at a yeah. wedding, which was very That was intense. pretty funny. <laughs> uh, I thought all of those were awesome ideas. And I was hoping the entire movie would basically be in that vein, just like interesting situations where dinosaurs are interacting with people in different settings and, you know, like how it's messing up daily life for people. They did have a number of settings I, I wrote down, like Big Rock National Park, Sierra Nevada Mountains, West Texas, Malta, uh, just to name a few. And then, of course, we get into a lot of the action happening in the Biosyn headquarters. Yeah, yeah. So all those clips I mentioned, too, were basically in the first two minutes of the movie. And then they introduced Biosyn and Peter Dodgson again. Dodgson. We got, <laughs> we got Dodgson here. We do have Dodgson here. So they're revitalized as a villain. Really... Again, they're finding the last little bits of the first Jurassic Park book and Jurassic Park, the Lost World novel mm -hmm. that haven't been in the other five movies and working them into this because yeah. the second Jurassic Park book had Dodgson running Biosyn and it was sort of like this movie where there was this other place and they were basically trying to steal the technology to mm -hmm. do whatever nefarious things. Although this had the addition of Maisie, the clone that went missing in that whole plot point. Sure. And her backstory is explained more. I did really like, though, that they brought back aspects of the book that hadn't been covered before. Yes. The the whole Maisie thing is maybe a little unnecessary, but... Oh, I, I enjoyed <laughs> the storyline with Maisie. Okay. I'm glad you did. They introduce, and obviously spoilers, we've already said there's lots of spoilers, but they introduce her mother and her mother's backstory and point of view, and they made her a really awesome scientist. Yeah, that's true. I guess that's cool. <laughs> it, uh, I thought it was. It just seemed, there were so many characters in this movie. It was like, why did they have to bring back another one that wasn't even a part of anything? Anyway, so. Well, I liked all the characters. Okay, I'm glad. <laughs> back to the dinosaurs. <laughs> There were a few other enjoyable short clips scattered throughout the movie. I think I found all of them. Mm -hmm. So there was a cheetah chasing a compi they showed really briefly that was pretty cool looking. It was like in slow-mo. They showed a Quetzalcoatlus nesting on top of the New World Trade Center, which they made crazy huge. So I noted at the time it was about a third as tall as the radio antenna or the antenna thing on top of the World Trade Center, which is really tall. It's like three to 400 feet tall. So this Quetzalcoatlus, they made basically 100 feet tall. <laughs> I think just for the scale to work with the, like they wanted to use that building because right. it has kind of a flat top and they wanted to do a nest with it. And if they made them true to scale, they would have looked really small. So instead they made them insanely huge, which I think actually could be kind of fun. It could be oh, yeah. sort of like a real life Godzilla versus Mothra mm -hmm. thing if you had this 100 foot Quetzalcoatlus going after something else in New York City. But they also had Claire rescuing a baby triceratops in I Nevada. Think I think it's a Nasutoceratops. Oh, it was a Nasutoceratops. Okay. Yeah, because they had a couple of them looked a lot like Nasutoceratops or even the Sinoceratops. Well, yeah. So, well, after she rescues the baby and they kind of scare this herd, that herd consists of Triceratops, Nasutoceratops, and Sinoceratops. Oh, okay. Yeah. They didn't have as much labeling, obviously, especially in this part because they're all out in the wild. So it was mm -hmm. a little bit hard to identify what they were going for with the different dinosaurs, especially with the babies because mm -hmm. they're missing a lot of the ornamentation. But that's good to know. And I thought that would be kind of a cool side plot if it was Claire the whole time trying to save the dinosaurs. Mm. But- she very quickly gets sidetracked on the whole Maisie Well, she thing. saves the baby Nasutoceratops, and then that's the link to Ellie Sattler. Yeah, yeah. So that's how you start getting these characters together. Yeah, they also showed Chris Pratt lassoing a Parasaurolophus, which was super weird, and it was the first of about 20 scenes where he uses his hand to magically calm down a dinosaur. Oh, you did call it the magic hand. <laughs> But the Parasaurolophus looked great. I mean, we kind of knew what to expect because mm -hmm. we saw them in the ads for the Olympics. Yeah. But they were really cool. They were cool. And I kind of enjoyed the idea of Parasaurolophus being like a horse. Because mm -hmm. I think we've talked a little bit about how 
the quote unquote duck billed dinosaurs or hadrosaurs right. might have been more horse like than any other sort of modern analog. They were definitely a herd animal. Yeah. Well, almost definitely. Probably and probably migrated, so and probably ran pretty quick and effectively and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I thought that was a, a clever way to do it. But I think maybe the coolest scene they had with dinosaurs in a surprising setting was when Maisie went down to some random log yard and there were a couple of sauropods in there. I think they're Apatosaurus. Were they Apatosaurus? Okay, mm -hmm. I wasn't sure if maybe they're supposed to be Dreadnoughtus since they introduced that later. No, that was, yeah, that just came later. Okay, so they were trying to basically lure them out of the log yard with a truck honking and maybe sounding vaguely like another sauropod. Mm -hmm. which I really enjoyed that. I thought that was super clever. I never would have expected that random interaction of people and dinosaurs like the, the sauropods yeah. getting in the way of a <laughs> logging operation. And how do you get them? Because they're so huge. You got to be careful how to get them out of the way. Yeah, exactly. And like, even if you, you can't, you might not be able to scare it away. And if you startle it, it might cause more damage. So yep. you want to like slowly, and you can't even just like kill it and remove it because it's going to weigh so much. You're mm -hmm. better off just sort of luring it away. So I really enjoyed that. But basically all of those scenes were within the first 15 minutes of the 150-minute movie. <laughs> and then the yeah. rest of the movie was less my favorite. Well, there were still some great dinosaur scenes throughout the movie. I will say I was a little bit disappointed because we saw this in a drive-in movie theater and I was really hoping that we'd see the scene of the T-Rex kind of terrorizing a drive-in movie. We've seen that in some of the trailers. Yeah, yeah. And I, I really wanted a picture of that while it was happening <laughs> at the drive-in, but it, we didn't see it. <laughs> yeah, that would have been perfect. That's Those were the kinds of scenes that I was just expecting a ton of. Just, you know, dinosaurs causing trouble. Yeah, they still cause trouble, especially at Biosyn. Yeah, but like in surprising settings, not yeah, just, yeah. you know, around well, the there was facility. Malta. There are a lot of dinosaurs in the Malta scenes. That is a good point. Yeah, the Malta thing was a good surprise. I thought it was pretty cool. We had seen a little bit of that clip of Chris Pratt on the motorcycle with some raptors chasing him, and we didn't really know what it was about. Yeah. But I thought the setup was pretty cool with, I guess it was called the Amber Clave Night Market, was the sort of that Malta Bazaar that they went into and the people were like, what are you doing here? You're clearly out of place. But there were all sorts of little details of different dinosaurs all over that. I kind of want, when it comes out on DVD, I want to pause it and like look at all the different frames because it seems like every frame of that mm. had little dinosaurs and different little cages and different yeah. things going on. Oh yeah, on. lots of details. Also, when it comes out on DVD, I'm looking forward to the special features or the extras because I've heard that there are some deleted scenes with dinosaurs. <laughs> And also, I wouldn't mind watching uh, some of the things we saw in the trailers or like that five-minute Cretaceous scene again. Yeah. Oh, I, mean, yeah. I know you can watch it on YouTube, but... Yeah, because that scene wasn't actually in the movie. That was really surprising that mm -hmm. they didn't have that five-minute, more realistic version of the Cretaceous that we talked about with Glenn McIntosh last week. Mm -hmm. But that was nowhere in there. That was surprising. I could have done without the laser-guided dinosaurs again, though. That was weird. The Atrociraptors? Yeah. <laughs> it was interesting. It was They explained that they basically trained these dinosaurs to work the way that Indoraptor worked, but they didn't have to make a hybrid dinosaur yeah. to do it. It sort of set up that scene of them chasing on the motorcycle, which was another scene that was very similar to something in the Lost World book, minus the driving onto the airplane bit, which prompted the weirdest line of the entire movie when the pilot said, I still got it. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't quite get it because she was a new character yeah we we're like and who she does didn't she still know got it the characters of owen grady and claire deering so what yeah that like, threw me off a little bit like owen still got it because he can <laughs> drive fast you don't know who he is right are you telling them you still got it they don't know who you are they don't know you used to have it yeah like, what's what are you talking about that's <laughs> such a weird line but anyway that scene overall was pretty cool with the raptors chasing. Maybe the laser was just there to give an excuse for like why they're getting chased right. by the dinosaurs. And why they keep chasing them. Because I was wondering, okay, how long can this dinosaur be going after the same target, the same moving target? And also, how many targets can they go for at once? Because she pointed her laser at multiple people. Yeah, that's true. At one point. Yeah. So that was interesting to see. And they sort of all knew, even if only one of them saw it, they were like following the other one's lead or something, yeah. I guess. Well-trained. Yeah. Well-trained raptors. 
Yeah. What I really want, though, is a spinoff of Justice Smith at the CIA, quote unquote, dangerous species division oh, yeah. that he was working at investigating dinosaur incidents around the U.S. I really thought they were setting that up because they showed him sitting at a desk and there was a quick shot of his screen with a guy getting attacked by pterosaurs, I think on a beach or something. Mm -hmm. And then he immediately switches focus to the locusts and man, the locusts. I don't want to get started on the locusts, but it's a dinosaur movie. They could have had a plague of compies <laughs> or omnivorous small troodontids or something. Just, I don't know why locusts. Plus, I think we had a fun fact a while ago about how there aren't giant bugs now because birds would just eat all of them. Hmm. And so that's that's what would happen. If there were huge locusts, they would get eaten by other things that are around. They, it, I don't think it would actually be a plague for very I long. I think they were just going for plague-like settings in general. Yeah. But the the giant locust thing, man, they spent a lot of time on that. There were some very pretty scenes with the locusts, the way they were flying or the way they were swarming, and then with the fire scene. Yeah, it, it did really seem, well done. I kind of felt like the reason, the whole reason they had locusts was so that they could light them on fire and then light the forest on fire mm. for that plot thing to like bring the dinosaurs in and also have cool effects with the fire in the background. But I don't know. I'm not sure where that idea came from. Well, I didn't mind. It brought all the characters together and you had a lot of the, I don't know, old guard, you know, Ellie, Alan, Grant, Ian Malcolm together and how they're working together in interesting ways and then how they come across Owen and Claire. Yeah. And Maisie. Yeah, there were some good Jeff Goldblum rants in there. Oh, yeah. You can never have too much Jeff Goldblum, although there wasn't enough, I think, of the original characters in the movie, but it was still good. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, I thought it was good. Yeah. And they did a lot of, I guess, nods, you know, to the fans. Yeah. Yeah. They did a lot of fan service, including like how Dodgson got killed basically the exact same way as Nedry mm -hmm. and all that. So it was like- With the Dilophosaurus. Yeah. It felt kind of like a remake and I was really hoping for something more new than what it was, but I, a lot of other people liked it. It was, so. yeah, it because it was- the nostalgia factor, and then they all, they did bring in new things because we got new dinosaurs. We had some feathered dinosaurs finally, yeah, which was true. great. Yeah, I think I think when it boiled down to it, the fans were really happy with it, and the critics really weren't because on Rotten Tomatoes it got a thirty percent by critics, but it got a seventy nine percent from fans or mm. you know just regular people rating it. And then on Metacritic, it had a 38, which again is critics. But on IMDb, it had a 6 out of 10, which is pretty decent. And that's just regular people rating it. Yeah. So Well, in the US, the opening weekend, there was something like 10.8 million people saw it. And they made more than 143 million in ticket sales in the US. And then globally, as of Monday, they've made 390 million. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So it was still a huge success. Yeah. So I think... A lot of the reviewers were hoping for something more new and maybe more dinosaurs and fun environments like I was. I saw that specifically referenced in a few reviews. But since that didn't happen, the reviews were pretty harsh. But a lot I, of the fans appreciated the callbacks and stuff like that. I wonder, because when we first heard Prehistoric Planet was coming, we thought, oh, well, that lines up really nicely. It's just a few weeks before Dominion comes out and everybody's primed and ready for more dinosaurs. And then when you see something like Prehistoric Planet, maybe that gets you in the mood for something a little more documentary like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what I was thinking actually was after watching Prehistoric Planet and Jurassic World is that I want totally different things from these sorts of movies or mm. TV shows. For Prehistoric Planet, like I'm happy that it's 100% just like trying to be as realistic as possible with, well, I guess with Prehistoric Planet, they did some interesting stuff too. <laughs> yeah. There are a lot of cool hypotheses. Yeah. But then with Jurassic World, I don't really care if something is twice as big as it should be mm. or, you know, even if some things don't have feathers when they should. I like the feathers and I like that they added feathers. But after seeing the feathers in Jurassic World, I was like, I realized that what I really would like to see in the Jurassic World movies is just crazy scenes with dinosaurs <laughs> or really scary stuff, preferably like more yeah. of like a horror movie style feel. And we didn't quite get that from Jurassic World. In a weird way, it was more realistic. The dinosaurs in it were much more realistic than any previous Jurassic movie because they had feathers and they had, they got rid of the 
hybrid dinosaurs and all that kind of stuff. So they made it way more realistic dinosaurs, mm -hmm. which you'd think would make me happy. Mm. But actually, I kind of wanted them to go the other way and make it almost more like a Godzilla movie. Like dinosaurs <laughs> just like rampaging through streets and like doing what the Jurassic Park movies do best. Mm. Because they're never going to be hyper realistic. They're never going to be as realistic as Prehistoric Planet. So you might as well go the other way and just have fun with like dinosaurs terrorizing people. Oh, I think they did have fun with it. There were a lot of moments where the dinosaurs were terrorizing the the main cast. That's true, yeah. yeah. And you were wondering, all right, how are they going to get out of this? And yeah, we see a lot of action. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in general, though, just want to reiterate the Jurassic Park, Jurassic World, that whole franchise has been really great for paleontology. It has, yeah. And I'm also still holding out for that Justice Smith spinoff because they show a family of T-Rex Blue's baby getting returned, a group of ankylosaurs, a herd of parasaurolophus, a huge flock of pterosaurs, some sauropods next to sequoias, and at least one, but I think three mosasaurs, as well as a group of cynoceratops, all still in the wild at the end. They didn't resolve any of the, you know, what are we going to do about dinosaurs in the wild? They mm -hmm. kind of started the movie with, we're all debating. Do you kill them? Do you leave them alone? Do you try to put them in a sanctuary? And then, like, they completely <laughs> left that alone because right. they got distracted by Maisie and well, locusts and stuff. Biosyn became a sanctuary. So it could be maybe the goal is to get all the dinosaurs to the Biosyn headquarters over yeah. time. See, that's what I want to see. I want to see them trying to, like, collect all these. Like, this, there was a huge flock of pterosaurs. There was, like, hundreds of, like, large pterosaurs. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you collect those and get them to a sanctuary? That's that's a movie I want to watch. <laughs> 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 or a spinoff series or whatever. But I hope they make that. Well, and in general, I enjoyed seeing all the animals. And I appreciated, too, that these movies, they can shine a light on some of the lesser known dinosaurs. Like Dominion, we have Pyroraptor, Moros, and then even Therizinosaurus, which mm -hmm. I thought was kind of the breakout star. Yeah, they and they also even they had Dreadnoughtus there too. Mm -hmm. it was, they were calling out a lot of new dinosaurs, which is super cool. And that was when I was researching for this episode, you know, trying to compare the Therizinosaurus from Prehistoric Planet and Jurassic World to get like a picture of each. Mm -hmm. I put in Therizinosaurus into Google and it, the first thing it suggested was, is Therizinosaurus real? <laughs> <laughs> and it makes me appreciate again that yeah. like Jurassic Park and the movies in general get people's interest really going in these dinosaurs. It's, well, it's such a weird one too because- It's unbelievable. You know it's a theropod <laughs> or like it looks theropod-like so you can kind of tell like, all right, this is similar to these other carnivorous dinosaurs we've seen. But then you learn later- this weird one was an herbivore. Yeah, but also it's got these insane claws and it's covered in feathers and it's really big. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like you said, it's eating plants. So it's like such a, it's unbelievable. It's a stranger than fiction thing. Yeah, and then that probably reignites your interest. Like, oh, okay, what other weird dinosaurs were there? Yeah, that's very true. I also want to mention, I thought the pyroraptor was really pretty with the red feathers. Oh, pyroraptor. I wasn't going to mention pyroraptor because that swimming under the ice hunting strategy craziness it did well, was just... I think it's it was kind of funny. If you think about the name Pyroraptor means fire thief, but then they put it in this ice environment. Although the reason it's called Pyroraptor is because the fossils were found after a forest fire. Oh, interesting. Sort of leading into our prehistoric planet. Although there was also a forest fire mm -hmm. in Jurassic World Dominion, but we didn't see pyroraptor around during the fire part only the ice part <laughs> maybe it was swimming <laughs> yeah maybe yeah that swimming thing was really crazy <laughs> but uh, you just said that you don't care how accurate the dinosaurs are in jurassic world i guess you want to see the crazy action and that is crazy action the fact that it was such a good swimmer and that's another thing like it introduces this idea of dinosaurs as being able to swim yeah that's true that is true. Yeah. Fair point. <laughs> but they showed it running faster than it could swim. So just the internal consistency, I thought, was a little weird. Okay. <laughs> well, chalk it up to its genetic makeup or something. It's half narwhal. <laughs> <laughs> it likes swimming in cold water. <laughs> Maybe. We don't know. <laughs> so it's possible. It did have large claws. And, you know, from what we know of Pyroraptor, it... 
had the claws that it might have used as footholds on its prey. You know, Mm -hmm. like jump on it, dig in with the claws, and then, you know, kind of hook into it and then sink its teeth in and take a lot of bites out that way. Yeah. So they needed the narwhal DNA for the the keratinous claw sheaths. (laughs) (laughs) No, that's for the swimming. Anyway. I should mention, we, we've we covered all of the dinosaurs that have appeared in these movies as our dinosaur of the day. So if you want to learn more about Pyroraptra, that was in episode 390. Very recently. Mm-hmm. And any of the other dinosaurs, you can go to the episode list on our website and then you'll find them there. And before we get into the prehistoric planet piece, let's just take a quick sponsor break so we don't have to stop in the middle. Okay, so... We've covered Jurassic World Dominion pretty well, I think. Mm-hmm. Well, we haven't talked about the dinosaurs in depth yet. Oh, true. Yeah. we need, But we need to do our comparison piece yep. to Prehistoric Planet, looking at the individual dinosaurs. So I want to start off by saying I enjoyed watching both. They had both great looking dinosaurs, a lot of fun details, and both of them helped promote paleontology a lot. i still see people talking about rewatching prehistoric planet oh, yeah. people are messaging or you know, see posts all over people talking about both of these shows mm-hmm. well i already rewatched the third episode of prehistoric planet with the velociraptors mm-hmm. sort of diving down oh yeah and that everything. was so cool and it's got dinochirus that was my favorite episode personally although i will say prehistoric planet for me totally stole jurassic world dominion's thunder in a major way since it came out a couple weeks earlier (laughs) and it had most of the dinosaurs that were like new and exciting to jurassic world dominion Mm. that uh, yeah to me it totally stole its thunder (laughs) (laughs) i saw it as uh they were both working together to get people excited about dinosaurs yeah for sure way more people are going to see jurassic world dominion than prehistoric planet no question but The biggest star, I think, of both and most interesting one has got to be Therizinosaurus. Mm -hmm. And I agree. And they looked really similar in both. Oh, by the way, we covered that one in episode 48. Oh, it's been a while. Mm -hmm. We might have to redo that one at some point. (laughs) So the Therizinosaurus in Dominion, I thought was pretty cool. One thing I didn't notice at the time or I was a little confused about, but I looked into it. The Therizinosaurus in Dominion was supposed to be blind. Oh, so okay. it had cloudy eyes, and I wasn't sure if that was supposed to be the nictating membrane over the eye, like the reptilian thing, mm-hmm. but it was clicking in the movie, and it was supposed to be using echolocation, which is apparently why it didn't know Claire was under the water, because, oh. you know, it's like a smooth surface of the water, so it couldn't detect her anymore. Okay. I'm not quite sure how it did so well fighting while totally blind, because it was pretty successfully, like, stabbing into lots of stuff. I guess its echolocation yeah. was very effective. Yeah. <laughs> and it was attacking... Pretty large animals. Yeah, that's true. Like that the definitely Giganotosaurus, makes it easier. Yeah, yeah. That scene, I did really enjoy the way they killed off the Giganotosaurus using oh, the yeah. Therizinosaurus claws. Yeah, because well, so Therizinosaurus, you know, is a theropod, but herb- herbivorous. We know it really did have those long arms and those giant claws. Yeah, yeah, the longest claws of any animal in history. Period. And we don't really know why. <laughs> yeah, because it was an herbivore. I've uh, heard it described as like salad tongs yeah i liked the take they had on it in prehistoric planet where they were sort of using them to get at like the beehive Mm -hmm, or maybe honey defend themselves a little bit things like that makes a lot of sense but i also think the way that they used dinochirus's claws in prehistoric planet where they're sort of like scooping up vegetation Mm -hmm. like that sort of thing is possible i don't know I also like in Jurassic World Dominion, they gave it insanely huge claws. Yeah. Like they looked like maybe they were like 10 feet long <laughs> or something. But we've talked about before how we only have the claw itself, not the sheath. And the claw sheath can be twice or three times or more as big. I mean, we've seen up close ourselves at the museum in Fukui, mm-hmm. Japan, just how huge those claws are. Yes. And they could have, you know, a big extension off of the claw to be something even more insane. Yeah. We, we're not really sure exactly how big they were with the claw sheath or how sharp they were. They were probably pretty sharp, but yeah. we're not sure. But it was this fun twist at the end where Therizinosaurus joins the fight between the Giga and T-Rex mm-hmm. or, you know, teams up with Rexy and then uses his claws to spear. Yeah. 
<laughs> the Giganotosaurus. I was thinking as I was watching it, like, oh, T Rex should be able to beat a Giganotosaurus mm -hmm. in a fight. But that's sort of the wrong, again, we've talked about like it's not just X animal versus Y animal. Right. In that situation, it seemed like Giganotosaurus was in way better shape. Like the T Rex seems sort of like on the older, maybe more feeble, if it's the same Rexy, you know, and it's yeah. like injured and. You know, it's been through plus a lot. It, it's yeah. had some giant battles already. <laughs> yeah. And if the Giganotosaurus is in its prime and like amped up on some extra large biosyn DNA fest, then yeah, I, I think it's reasonable that it was holding its own. Mm -hmm. Although its head was definitely way too wide. They always do that with everything. The heads the, are a lot wider than they should be on any, everything except for T-Rex, which did have a really wide head. Right. And now that I think about it, the last two big fights that we've seen Rexy have, Rexy's had a partner. Yeah, that's true. Blue and the Mosasaur. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, just comparing, as you'd expect, the prehistoric planet there, Xenosaurus, definitely looked a lot more accurate. But the one in Jurassic World Dominion was also pretty good. They both had feathers. Yeah, they both had feathers. The feathers looked pretty good. Actually, I saw some people saying they thought both of them might have had too much feathering hmm. because since they're so big, the same logic that applies oh, to T-Rex not too being. Hot. Yeah, exactly. T-Rex maybe didn't have so many feathers because it was really big. Maybe the same thing is true of Therizinosaurus since it was a very large, <laughs> mm. extremely large animal. Well, in prehistoric planet, they show some baby Therizinosaurus, so maybe those were fuzzier because they're smaller. They look pretty similar to me. Like I said, they were both fully covered head to toe, yeah. essentially, in feathers. So... I could see maybe a Therizinosaurus being a little bit less feathery as a full-sized one. Might be the only really thing that could be different about the prehistoric planet one. The rest of it is sort of speculation about what it's using its claws for, and that's something really hard to know. Mm. Then there was a Velociraptor, of course, appears in both. Yep, the, the Velociraptor in Jurassic World Dominion is completely different in every way from the one that's in <laughs> prehistoric planet. Yep. That is, like I said, that's my favorite scene in the whole series was the velociraptor on that cliff mm -hmm. using Going its after big the pterosaurs. Yeah. The, the, just because we talk about trees down versus ground up or wing assisted incline running or all the different hypotheses for why feathers evolved. And this idea that it was something really niche like hunting something on a cliff and using its feathers to sort of glide down to nests more easily and also dive down and catch escaping prey without dying on the way down you know dove way down that oh, cliff yeah and you watch it you're like oh no the velociraptor went too far down it's gonna get hurt and it just bounced back up because it descended just slowly enough using the little bit of feathers it had yeah that it was okay i love that i thought that was awesome but then yeah you've got blue which is you got blue and baby blue yeah also known as beta they didn't even put feathers on the baby blue, but I guess they've established from the very first movie that the baby Velociraptor didn't have feathers because that yeah. was like the first thing they saw. We saw blue as a baby in Fallen Kingdom too. Oh, also, also didn't, didn't have, have feathers. feathers. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so I guess they gave up on the whole Velociraptor having feathers, but they did introduce the new Atrociraptor or Atrociraptor mm -hmm. with feathers, so that was cool. Yeah. I think it had feathers, right, in Jurassic World Dominion? I don't think it did have feathers in Dominion. Oh, it didn't? Okay, I'm mixing it up with the prehistoric planet one. So, I mean, I guess that's the difference then, right? The prehistoric planet one is covered in feathers mm -hmm. again, but the Jurassic World one was... I'd say the biggest difference is in their behaviors, how that's depicted, because <laughs> yeah. in prehistoric planet, you see a Trociraptor taking advantage of a forest fire and the smoke to go hunt and get insects. Was that the one that like picked up a burning stick? Yeah. That was crazy. Yeah. I remember seeing that. I was like, is it really going to pick that? Okay, what's it going to do with that? And the <laughs> fact that it like understood it was fire, like that is that is one far-fetched <laughs> hypothesis. Well, it could have happened. That's it, the fun of it. It technically could have happened, yes. Well, think about what crows can do. Yeah, but they don't, again, pick up like mm. burning cigarettes and take them somewhere to light a fire to <laughs> scare out ants or something. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I thought it was a really fun scene in Prehistoric Planet. And then, of course, that's very different to the, I think, much larger Atrociraptor in Dominion. Yeah, yeah, I think it was a lot bigger. It's kind of hard to tell because the 
Like you said, the Trosa raptor, it was like sort of in a burning forest, so you mm-hmm. didn't see it next to much else. But the fact that it's going after insects, mm-hmm. and then it picked up the stick to use the smoke to get rid of parasites in its feathers. Yeah. <laughs> that's so, that's very clever. That would be cool. Clever girl. Yeah. And I, the other interesting thing that I've, I felt like sort of stole the thunder of Dominion was they're sort of a similar color. Even though one was feathered and one wasn't, they're both that sort of brownish mm. color. So they looked pretty similar in that way. But in Dominion, they were very fast, very ferocious, and acrobatic, I'd say. Yeah, that's for sure. And highly motivated to yeah. murder whatever a laser pointer well, goes to. smart in a different way because they're following the laser pointer. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, they're both introduced as probably the smartest animals in either of those series. Mm-hmm. You already mentioned Garrett Dreadnoughtus, but I just want to bring up the prehistoric planet Dreadnoughtus has those crazy neck air sacs. <laughs> yeah, that was so crazy <laughs> when we saw that. I had um, a note as neck bubbles. That didn't sound quite right, though. <laughs> yeah, I think neck bubbles is a good description of it. The sort of inflated and deflated. At first, I thought it was supposed to be going with its breaths. Like the air sacs inflating in series as it breathes in and then deflating as they breathe out. But that obviously isn't the case because they weren't all doing it all the time. It was sort of, it was only when they were trying to do the displays that they were doing it. And then they stopped having them inflated when they were fully combating each other and like bashing their necks together. They didn't have their their neck bubbles out. So that was very interesting. I was hoping because they have associated explanations with the episodes for why they made the decisions they made and what sort of scientific data there is to back up the different decisions they made that they would talk about that, but they didn't. I did find an AMA online though, and Darren Nash, who was the main consulting paleontologist on it, said that basically the logic is they have these really long necks, so it would make sense if they had a display structure on them. Mm-hmm. And that's basically it. So it's there isn't really any evidence at all of these sorts of neck bubbles. But I thought it was a really fun concept. It, it is a fun concept. Really entertaining to watch. Yeah. And it, it's also kind of funny because we didn't see anything like that in Jurassic World Dominion, just like crazy, mm-hmm. you know, sauropod. The Dreadnoughtus was basically exactly the same as all the... The only reason we knew it was a Dreadnoughtus was because Alan Grant goes, look, it's a Dreadnoughtus. It means fear nothing dinosaur. Yeah. Uh, that one was episode nine we covered it oh wow that was a long time ago yeah super cool i mean it's a really cool dinosaur i'm glad they mentioned it because again it's a new dinosaur and people will probably be interested in seeing what it is but the prehistoric planet one (laughs) it's hilarious i think in dominion they show dreadnoughtus briefly in a lake at one point yeah it was a weird choice no i well i thought that could be an interesting callback to the idea of you know when we thought sauropods were so big that they needed to be in aquatic environments. Yeah, but they obviously don't, they weren't showing like all sauropods in lakes because they had that cool scene with Maisie yeah. and the sauropods coming out of the logging area. So it wasn't like they were saying all sauropods have to be in lakes. That one might've just been taking a bath. Yeah, possible, sure. I mean, like how they showed the T-Rex swimming in prehistoric planet, you know, and we also had the <laughs> pyroraptor swimming in the under the ice in Jurassic World Dominion. We know that dinosaurs probably were pretty decent swimmers and including sauropods, you know, they probably did okay just like how elephants now today do mm-hmm. a pretty good job swimming. I really liked the T-Rex in Prehistoric Planet and how they had the end of its tail bitten off and mm-hmm. like the battle scars and it had just finished fighting a triceratops so it had like wounds to deal with and everything. Right. In that way, that was also similar to Dominion in that both of the T-Rex were pretty wounded. Yeah. And had seen a lot of battles in their time. In Prehistoric Planet 2, there's that scene of the family of Tyrannosaurs swimming, Mm -hmm. which was a little bit sad, the end of that scene. Did one of the babies not make it? Was that the thing? that was the thing. But I like the idea of these large dinosaurs being able to swim and go different places depending on where they think the best resources might be. Yeah, for sure. And if you want to hear more about T-Rex, that was episode 200. We did it as a dinosaur of the day. Then we we mentioned a little bit already that Triceratops, Nasutoceratops, Cynoceratops, 
the Triceratops in Prehistoric Planet, I really liked that they had this herd that, you know, they eat these kind of poisonous plants and then they go to a cave to eat clay to counteract Mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty clever. There were so many things in Prehistoric Planet that to me felt like someone took Planet Earth 2 and maybe a little bit of Planet Earth Mm -hmm. and then recreated the whole thing with dinosaurs instead of birds. Yeah. (laughs) Because we've seen that kind of thing. I don't know if it was in Planet Earth, but we've seen animals where they eat clay to neutralize toxins before. And just like there were so many little details like that Mm -hmm. where it's it was very bird-like behavior that they were showing the dinosaurs doing. And it's 100% verified that birds do that kind of thing and the only extension for making it in prehistoric planet was well we're just gonna have dinosaurs do that thing that we know that birds already do so like for example you had the carnotaurus Mm -hmm. with those arms and like that was colorful display basically the same in prehistoric planet that carnotaurus was doing the same kind of mating dance that we've seen in must have been planet earth yeah i think it was planet earth too with the, which was one of my favorite scenes, the bird that <laughs> it's doing its dance and then all of a sudden, woof, all the feathers pop out. Oh, it like puffs out a giant like green smiley face yeah. looking thing below its yeah. neck. <laughs> yeah. So this carnotaurus was doing really similar moves and then it outstretches its very short arms mm-hmm. and it's, I think it was blue or like a blue green yeah. below. And the theory or the idea there is that, well, carnotaurus had incredibly short arms, even Mm -hmm. proportionally shorter than T-Rex arms. Why were they there? Yeah. Could it have been for a display, a mating thing? Yeah. And the the biggest mystery about Carnotaurus is that its arms, even though they're very short, they have huge shoulder blades with a lot of space for muscle attachment points. And their shoulder joint is very flexible. Mm -hmm. So it's a big mystery of like, why did they need such strong arms, even though they were so short? And so with Mononychus or any of the Alvarosaurids, we think that it was for digging. That's sort of a common thing because you get better leverage if you have that shorter arm. It's easier to dig with the shorter arms but big claws. But with Carnotaurus, it doesn't have claws. Mm-hmm. So it does, it's like, okay, why? It's it's not clawing at anything. It's got like, they look like baby hands <laughs> at the end of these <laughs> super strong arms. It's so weird. <laughs> so yeah, there's a huge mystery there. And I think the, the display... Being able to flail the arms in circles, and that's why they need the this really flexible shoulder joint, is as good of an explanation as anything. Yeah. Although we definitely, again, that's just like one possible explanation, right, for what they could be used for. I mean, that's that's the beauty of these kinds of shows, though, is that you can explore these ideas and get people excited and interested, and maybe that'll prompt some people to go down a research rabbit hole. Oh yeah, that's true, definitely. And then, of course, we brought up Carnotaurus because it was also in Dominion in the Malta scenes. Yes. Yeah. And it didn't really have too much of a role. It was basically just eating somebody or fighting with uh, Baryonyx or something. Yeah. But you can always tell it's a Carnotaurus because... The horns above the eyes and the big roundish head from profile view. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Which is how we know it looked. We talk about that one in episode 85. Yeah. And again... Basically, the same applies for most of the dinosaurs in Dominion versus Prehistoric Planet. The one in Dominion is bigger, probably, than it was in real life and has a wider head than it would have had in real life. But other than that, it was fairly realistic. Mm -hmm. The Carnotaurus is pretty good in Jurassic World in general. Yeah. Yeah, I like the way it looks. I should also quickly mention the Mononychus because we were just talking about the the digging for termites. Mm. This one was only in Prehistoric Planet, not in Dominion. But I just love it. I'm I'm so glad they, they snuck an Alvarosaurid in there because they're so <laughs> weird. They snuck in all three of our favorite weirdos. Yeah. They got the Alvarosaurid with the little claws yeah. digging. They got the Therizinosaurus, yep. the, the huge claws. And then they also had the... Dinochirus. Yeah, the Dinochirus. The, Which was the scratching itself binks. like a bear. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's also one of my favorite things is how animals scratch themselves. I don't know why I love it so much, but I do. So <laughs> that was great. And I, I liked their, their hypothesis that maybe it had those big scoopy claws for getting aquatic vegetation up. Mm -hmm. That was a really fun idea. I was hoping when it needed to itch itself that it was going to see another Dinochirus and they were going to like get a good scratch going with each other. (laughs) (laughs) But the tree was cool too. Yeah. I'm still happy. Yeah. 
But what were you going to say about the Mononychus? Oh, I'm just glad that was in there. Yeah. And they, oh, they did that cool thing too, where they gave it at like an owl's face with the more or less satellite dish feather pattern around its eyes mm. to focus the sound in towards its ears. Mm -hmm. And apparently there's a little bit of research that shows that maybe they had owl-like hearing. So maybe they did have these feather discs on their face. We don't know. We haven't found preserved feather discs of them or anything like that. But based on their ear alone, it's plausible that maybe they had something like that, which is super cool. Yeah. I love that idea. As happy when I went through all the dinosaurs that were in Prehistoric Planet, we've covered most of them in our Dinosaur of the Day, too. So Amanonychus, we did episode 218, and Dinochirus, we did in episode 10. So yeah, we've covered pretty much all of them. <laughs> yeah. There were a few other dinosaurs in Dominion that weren't in Prehistoric Planet. We've already talked about a few of them, but some of them we haven't talked about yet is... Ankylosaurus, which only briefly appeared at the end. I know you were disappointed, Garrett. Yeah, but I liked that they established that they're still out there mm -hmm. for my my fantasy about a spinoff where I get the movie that I, I secretly wanted, not so secretly wanted, out of Dominion. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And then there was Moros, which had a really brief appearance. I think we just see it attack something. Oh, yeah. And Biosyn. Yeah, that was cool. I was surprised. They were like, there's Morose. I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're sneaking that guy in? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was cool. That's another one I could see people like Googling, like, what is what is Morose? Yeah. It's a dinosaur? Exactly. And that one is our dinosaur of the day for this episode. Oh. -ho. So, yeah, overall, we enjoyed Dominion and Prehistoric Planet for very different reasons. Obviously, both of them, the dinosaurs were really I love the details and the way they look. And of course, they, they both have their own speculations about how these animals would have behaved. Yeah, I was actually kind of surprised. There might be more speculative stuff going on in Prehistoric Planet than there was in Jurassic World Dominion. Yeah, but it is based on science that's been done before and on comparing to modern animals. Yeah. So it's not like it comes out of nowhere. Yeah. And overall, the the recreations in Prehistoric Planet are a lot more accurate, but they definitely took a lot of fun <laughs> hypotheses and snuck them in there. Yeah. And I think both of them do a great job of promoting paleontology and getting people interested in mm -hmm. dinosaurs and other prehistoric animals. I, should, I feel like I should also mention, too, because I mentioned what the reviews said of Jurassic World Dominion. People loved Prehistoric Planet. Mm -hmm. It's got 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. And on Metacritic, it's gotten 85 out of 100, which is very high. It's a super good rating and so cool for a dinosaur feature that includes zero people, right? It's oh, yeah. fully the planet Earth 2 style where you have the narrator and the occasional cutaway to David Attenborough in a museum or whatever at the very beginning. But other than that, it's just dinosaurs doing their thing. There's no people running around with them or anything. Right. Well, in the extras where they explain some of the science behind it, then you see some people, some paleontologists. Oh, yeah. yeah, you see some scientists in there for sure, which is really cool. And they mm -hmm. had a, a good selection. Several of them we've interviewed too, which mm -hmm. was really cool to see them. Definitely. So I hope they make a prehistoric planet too. Yeah. Yeah. Every dinosaur that was in prehistoric planet was from basically about the last five to six million years of the Cretaceous. Mm -hmm. Basically, the I think the earliest one they had was something like maybe Tarbosaurus about 72 million years ago, and then through 66 million years. That's it. There's nothing from the Jurassic, nothing from the Triassic, nothing even from the early oh, Cretaceous. Yeah. So there's a lot to explore there. There are so much. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, they had Dreadnoughtus because that was one of the latest Titanosaurs, mm. but we didn't have anything like Giraffe Titan. There was no Stegosaurs. We didn't have any of the weird Triassic stuff. There's, there's just so much more they could do. Yeah. And it is called Prehistoric Planet. So it's, it's very not possible. not all dinosaurs. Yeah. You know, there's so many more places they could go with it. I would love to see more. Even if it isn't dinosaurs, I, I love all that paleontological stuff. So. so recap, we liked both and we want to see more. Like Dominion, we want to see that spinoff. <laughs> yeah. Prehistoric Planet, we want to see sequels. <laughs> <laughs> We're greedy like that. Yeah. You, get, you can never have too much dinosaur content, that's for sure. Yeah. So now we're about to get into our dinosaur of the day, but real quick, we're just going to pause for another sponsor break. 
And now onto our dinosaur of the day, Morose, which was a request from PaleoMike716 via our Patreon and Discord, so thanks. It was a tyrannosauroid that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Utah in the U.S., Cedar Mountain Formation. It looked like a small theropod, you know, walked on two legs and it had sharp teeth and feathers. And we did talk about Morose back in episode 223 as a news item when it was first named, but we're bringing it up again here because it was in Jurassic World Dominion. It was in the preview during that flashback to the Cretaceous, where it's eating some rotten flesh stuck in Giganotosaurus' teeth. Oh, yeah, that's where it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was awesome. And then we see it in a brief scene or cameo in Biosyn, as we mentioned earlier. And it's depicted as feathered in Dominion, which was cool. Mm -hmm. The type species is Morose intrepidus. The genus name is Greek for, quote, the embodiment of impending doom in reference to the establishment of the Cretaceous Tyrannosauroid lineage in North America, end quote. And the species name means intrepid in Latin, and it refers to it probably being an early arrival from Asia. Morose was named in 2019 by Lindsay Zano and others, and the fossils found include a complete right leg and parts of the foot from a subadult. It was about six or seven years old when it died. The limb bones were found jutting out of a hillside in 2013, and then two teeth were found nearby that were probably from Morose. It's estimated to weigh 172 pounds, or 78 kilograms, and its leg was about 4 feet or 1.2 meters long. It was probably pretty quick and nimble. It had these slender foot bones, which were similar into proportion to ornithomimids, and it had a slender tibia that was longer than the femur. Mm. Sometimes that means that they're good sprinters. Yeah. It was lightweight and it had advanced sensory capabilities. And it was carnivorous. It could have run down its prey and stayed away from larger predators, probably. It was found to have a slow to moderate growth rate. And it's about 15 million years older than other known North American tyrannosauroids. Yeah, it's one of those really good ones that filled in a missing piece because we knew we had early tyrannosauroids in Asia, and then we had the really advanced ones that were much bigger in North America, but Morose sort of neatly fit in the middle. Yeah. And Morose lived alongside Deinonychus, the allosauroid siats, pterosaurs, crocodilians, turtles, amphibians, fish, and mammals. And our fun fact of the day first starts with a reminder of our fun fact from episode 223, and that's that Morose weighed an estimated 78 kilograms, like you said, mm -hmm. and lived about 30 million years before T-Rex, which conservatively weighed about 6,000 kilograms. Just a little heavier. Yeah, that's almost 100 times as big if you're doing the math. <laughs> yeah, no big deal. Although you did mention that it was a juvenile, so that it, maybe it weighed a little bit more as an adult. <laughs> yeah. But assuming that... It was near its peak size because you did say that it had slow to moderate growth rate, so maybe it didn't get that much bigger. And also assuming that each tyrannosaur lives about 20 years, and that's like around the time that it mates, so that would be like the age of a generation, that would give you an average increase of about 4 grams or 0 0.14 ounces per generation hmm. from the evolution of morose to T-Rex, which is it isn't nothing. You know, it's slowly getting bigger. Yeah. That's about the weight of two dimes <laughs> for comparison. <laughs> of course, if it grew bigger or if the generations were any faster, because 20 years is kind of on the long side, then it would be less. Maybe it's only a gram or two. But it's still a, a significant, you could actually measure that over time, potentially, although it would be hard to get with the averages <laughs> among just a couple of generations. There is a better example, though, of a huge evolution in size, even though it seems like a really impressive change going from 78 kilograms. So that is a pretty huge change, you know, 78 kilograms up to 6,000 kilograms, even though it is over a relatively long period of time at 30 million years. But there is a much faster evolution of huge body size that we've seen in the past, and that's getting to the blue whale. So myocetus to the blue whale is about a 47 million year evolution, and it went from 335 kilograms to 130,000 kilograms, <laughs> which is crazy. Whales also have a significantly longer lifespan and tend to mate, therefore, at later ages hmm. than T. rex presumably would have. And so the estimate there is that in that evolution, 
each generation would, if it was a linear progression, would have put on about 140 grams or a third of a pound per generation, Ooh, which is pretty impressive, right? Is. To keep that up for tens of millions of years. Yes. But that's, you know, what you got to do if you're going to get up to this insane largest animal ever to have lived. And as a bonus fun fact, the largest carnivore in all of Earth's history is neither T-Rex nor Giganotosaurus as claimed in Jurassic World Dominion. Oh, I know where this is going. The animal is alive today. And again, it's the blue whale. Yeah, you said that. <laughs> you said that during the movie. <laughs> it was annoying because they were like, oh, Giganotosaurus, that's the real biggest predator of all time or whatever. It's like, no, the blue whale. The blue whale is the biggest carnivore of all time. Nothing comes even remotely close. It's over 10 times the size of either Giganotosaurus or T-Rex. Yeah, okay. Terrestrial, though. Yeah. But I mean, they've got a Mosasaur and they even had a whole thing in an earlier movie about how Mosasaur, we need more teeth to get the Mosasaur involved, all that stuff. It's easier to avoid blue whales and Mosasaurs as a human than it is to avoid a Giganotosaurus in Jurassic World Dominion world. Well, that's for sure. Yeah. Plus, you don't really have to worry about blue whales because they don't eat human sized prey. Mm -hmm. But by the amount of meat consumed... They are also the biggest predator by far. They consume about one ton of meat every single day, which is an insane amount. Of, I can't even fathom what eating a ton of meat a day would be like. It's mostly in the form of krill, but they do also eat small fish. Krill, for the record, are not plankton. A lot of people think krill are plankton. Krill eat plankton. Krill are basically small shrimp-like crustaceans. They look just like shrimp to a non-expert like me. I see a picture of a krill. I'm like, yeah, it's shrimp, but it's krill. They're not particularly tiny. Many species range from about half an inch to several inches long. So they look more like crayfish or like fairly big shrimp, a lot of them do. And there's at least one species that regularly reaches half a foot long. Hmm. It's not a tiny animal, krill. So the way I would look at it is whales are basically shrimp specialist hyper carnivores. <laughs> <laughs> sort of like a colossal anteater or a mononychus of the sea. Oh, that's got a nice ring to it. The mononychus of the sea. <laughs> <laughs> the, with the colossal mononychus of the sea. Yep. Because <laughs> it's got to be really big. True. And they also have weirdly reduced limbs as they evolved their specialty too, just like mononychus. Yeah. Well, when you figure out what works. Yeah, exactly. It's definitely working for them. <laughs> And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thank you for listening. Again, if you want more information about all the dinosaurs that we mentioned in this episode, all the ones that appeared in Jurassic World Dominion and Prehistoric Planet, then go to our website, the episode page at inodino.com, and you can listen to our Dinosaur of the Day deep dives about them. And as a reminder, we will be back with our regular episodes when we return from parental leave and in the meantime, though, don't worry, we've got more interviews and other content for you in the coming weeks. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.